Hi everyone, it's Natalie here. So um, today I decided to come on and do a VR to Natalia at uh, Tarot Shrink talking about something that's come up a lot within the community, like within the Tarot online community about um, deck collecting and whether it is or isn't like uh, or could be realistically compared to what we do when we collect books, right? So uh, for those of us who read a lot or have read a lot of books or have needed to use books for various different things and therefore have copies of them available to refer to, et cetera, et cetera, you know, that's a really, obviously a really helpful thing to do. Um, so how does that compare to having like a tarot library, right? Which I think in some ways I, is for me anyway, like as I think about it, not a dissimilar thing um, from uh, trying to say I don't collect. I'm not a tarot collector. I use tarot decks and um, it's my tarot library, right? It's not a, but the truth is, if I'm really honest with myself, of course I'm collecting. I mean, there, there are decks that I have that I don't really use, right? That I, but that I refuse to part with. So then why do we hold on to those, right? So I'm going to give an example. Um, Natalia chose Dostoevsky uh, and a translation um, of a Dostoevsky book because her husband collects books. Um, and I'm going to use an example uh, from a similar world, right? So here is an example of a book. She was referring to translation or comparing, um, you know, translations of Rider Waite Smith decks to, um, or different iterations of, of Rider Waite Smith decks to, um, being the same thing as like collecting, uh, books, different translations of a particular author, right? Uh, so she chose to use Dostoevsky as that, um, comparison for that comparison. So I'm going to use Chekhov, <laughs> by which, by whom I mean, um, Anton Chekhov. So I actually, at a certain moment in my career, um, when I was still a, a theater professor, I had multiple translations, probably eight or ten different translations of Chekhov plays. Not all of the same plays, not all of the same, um, you know, combinations of plays, etc. But probably, but like I of the Cherry Orchard in particular, because I directed it at one point, um, and same with Three Sisters, I'd acted in it and directed it. I probably had, oh, I don't know, like at least five of each of those. Right now I have one translation. I no longer work in theater, so I really don't need to keep translations of plays anymore. But one of the few that I've kept is Michael Frayn's translation of these plays. Um, because his translation was not like the others. So something in, uh, you Americans have trouble with is understanding Chekhov is comedy, right? Uh, to Russians, it's hysterical. Right? The whole thing is hysterical. It's very funny. It's comedy. Americans couldn't make sense of any of these plays as being comedy. And I remember it's it's like a, a rite of passage in drama schools, right? Where you, you're training and you're doing your very serious, like, deep actor method training. Um, you know, you've, re you've read your Stanislavski, you've read your Uta Hagen, you've read, uh, you know, all of the different um, theorists and so forth, and you're working with Chekhov. And it's so serious. <laughs> you know, the situations are so serious. I'm going to use the play The Cherry Orchard to illustrate this, right? So in The Cherry Orchard, this very wealthy family suddenly loses all of their wealth. It's all gone. Um, and someone who had previously been um, of like the, the surf community, um, ha who had kind of started to rise up a little bit and make their own money, uh, offers to buy the cherry orchard and they end up having to sell it. It becomes necessary, right? It sounds kind of tragic, right? How unfortunate, how, you know, either it's, depending on who you are, it's either good or it's bad, right? It's told from both perspectives. Um, so it really depends on which side of that fence you feel you identify with. But that said, um, it is a comedy. It is a comedy, but it's only a comedy once it's put in a particular, once it's translated a particular way and the language has a particular rhythm uh, and a beat and a measure to it 
that's almost musical and which lends itself to farce, which in the States uh, and certainly in Britain, we understand inherently, right? We understand the comedy of farce. If you don't know what I'm talking about, anyone who's watched the TV show Friends understands farce because the comic timing and the rhythm of that particular show and the way it's written is absolutely written in farce, right? <laughs> it's written as farce. This one exits that way. It's all heightened. It's ridiculous. Uh, the stakes are, are, are high, but yet they're about something stupid or, or simple or, you know, that could have been avoided easily. You know, it's that kind of thing. So uh, once it was told from that perspective, and once I could read it with that kind of rhythm, with that kind of pace, with that sort of timing, it became hysterically funny. As an actor, I remember getting my hands on, on these translations in a workshop um, with a director that I had known from her work at the National Theatre in, in Britain, uh, in London. And we worked on, uh, you know, a couple of different scenes and... Um, there, were, there was a whole group of us as, that were actors within our first 10 years of our careers, right, who were in the workshop. And it was, it was beautiful because suddenly we all understood where did the comedy come from? Why was it there? What was the purpose of it? Because there was an element that was present in the Russian, the original Russian, that was not present in the English translations that we'd read because English people and English-speaking people we're not reading it <laughs> with the same context, right? With the same mind as the Russians had been. So that's a good example of it. Now, why do I keep it? I keep it because I don't need to read it anymore, but I love it. Um, and even though it is still right up here, sometimes there are moments where I might need to refer to it or I have needed to refer to it when I still get asked to guest um, teach places, which is rare, but it does happen. Um, you know, being able to refer to that specifically when speaking about timing is important. So let's turn this to the discussion about tarot. How long did I beef on about that? Um, so <laughs> there we go. Um, sometimes it's worth it to like draw these things out a little bit. When we're talking about, so one of the arguments is like, why have so many different RWS decks, right, on your shelf, right? You only, why would you need why would anyone need, right, more than just this, right? This is the um, centennial edition of the Waite Smith, a Smith Waite centennial edition, um, which I keep in order because occasionally when I'm reading for clients, I get tarot conversant people who will understand where I'm coming from with the deck I'm using that is that corresponds to this deck. And so having it in order so I can find the, the corresponding card is really important because sometimes then the, if I can say, hey, in the Rider Waite Smith, it's this, suddenly something opens up for that client, right? So a clone, an example, when we talk about a clone of this deck, and here's why I don't have many of these, what I would call or refer to as a clone, right? Um, this is one that I keep in this box. This is my original. Um, universal weight deck that I had from back in the early 90s when I started reading. Um, this I would call a clone, right? So the difference between this deck and uh, this deck, ooh, first of all, this one still smells like it always has. It's very familiar, right? But they're very, very similar very similar decks, um, right? They are clones of one another. The colors in the universal weight are brighter. So, you know, we can see this most easily in the full card. I'm not gonna go through the whole deck because this one's not in order anyway, and it's not. this is not the point. But you can see clearly that this is a clone, right? The lines are very similar. It's the same drawing. It is drawn out and made you know, made made a little bit more modern, etc. I do love the backings of these cards. It's part of what sold me in the first place because I was all into my sun, moons, and stars, and so on. Um, but these two are clones, right? Another clone, or one I would re refer to maybe as being a clone, might be like the modern witch tarot, right? Which I, sadly, I rarely use. But I keep it, even though it's a clone. Why? Because it's a different translation, <laughs> 
you know, in, in current times, I can't understand this translation um, as being the same. You know, this doesn't translate as, as a Ten of Swords in the same way. Oh, I got to go back to the original here. Um, this is off the cuff, so I'm not exactly as prepared. So it's not going to be quite as concise. It's a little bit of a mess. Um, you know, we can tell we're in the same universe here. It's maybe akin to two different Shakespeare productions, right? Where you've got one production of Shakespeare here that's done in the classical style, right? Everything looks Elizabethan, or at least it looks um, pre-industrial, okay? And, it, and so we can understand it because it's pre-industrial. This is beyond pre-industrial, right? This is going into, um, you know, this is, this is post-millennial. Um, that's a smartphone in her hands and she's, uh, having a response to the overwhelm and, you know, having something online blow up and it's horrific. That's something we don't understand, right? Before, before the invention of a smartphone. So it's highly specific. It's highly specific. Is it still Rider Waite Smith? Absolutely it is. Unmistakably it is, right? In the same way that uh, a contemporary production of Shakespeare um, set in 2010, we'll, we'll just make believe, right? Because that's around, two, oh, eight is, oh, 08 is around when the time the, the, the smartphones started to emerge, you know, but we didn't all start to have them, let's say, until so maybe 2010, maybe 2012, right? 2012, 2014, somewhere in there. So we set the play in this era, it changes meaning right? The same thing is changed. It's the same, same image or the same text, right? But it's changed meaning and significance. We understand it differently. So, um, for me, oh, that's not the right, there we go. So for me, that's, I find that interesting, you know, I find that in, and it tells me something very, very different, um, than, I don't know, than some, than another one, right? Now, that said, I should keep these uh, to hand because I'm going to keep illustrating my point about what is or is not a clone. Here's another example. Um, yeah, it's not really a clone. Um, oh, yeah. So I often refer to the Siddhartha Tarot as being, um, a if you know the writer Waite Smith inside and out, you can read with the Siddhartha Tarot, right? That's my whole premise. Um, behind this deck. Now let me see if I can actually find um, yeah, the moon, the empress, the wheel. Yeah, the wheel's a good one. Let's work with that. Um, so in the same way that we're talking about the wheel of fortune, right? We've got the wheel of fortune here and we've got the wheel of fortune here, right? They're very similar right? It's a similar type of story that we're telling, but we're telling them not just in completely different languages, but different cultures and using a different mythology, right? So we're telling the hero's journey. We're telling it with the same plot structure, but we're telling it uh, using some, some similar symbolism, but which is also different. Um, and it comes, the way that it comes together, the effect is the same, right? But one of them gives you an ending uh, that's going to maybe end one way, and the other one gives you an ending that can end, you know, a totally different way. One is telling you, here's how to achieve enlightenment. Here's how to view uh, the, the reception of this card. Here's how to receive this card um, and receive it in a way that can lead to a more enlightened perspective. This one is simply saying, this is this card, and here are the possibilities within this card. Um, whether they lead to enlightenment or not, nah, who knows, right? But this one holds the, more, holds the potential, it gives an instruction, it gives a potential and a possibility. This one's just telling us what the Wheel of Fortune is about, what it can lead to, um, you know, and, and both, depending the cards on around them, will tell us more about how we may or may not, um, being distracted by a little friend here, 
uh, how we may or may not uh, uh, accomplish that, right? So, not clones. Speaking, you know, are they are they speaking a similar type of language in a way? Yes, they're using the same system, the same structure, uh, a lot of the same principles, but they're telling it very differently. I don't think there's anyone out there who would call the Siddhartha Tarot, tarot a, a, a Rider Waite Smith clone, right? I don't think they would, but you know, you just don't know. Um, this is another one that I think many people would say is a, a would call a Rider Waite Smith clone, right? This is the Guardian of the Night Tarot, and I think um, I pulled this one because I think in one of her other videos she was talking about this card. Natalia was talking about this card, right? Um, in the same way that the Siddhartha Tarot is following a similar structure and pattern, um, we could say that um, the Guardian of the Night Tarot is doing the same thing. I'm just looking for, well, I'm looking, I'm searching for a major that I can hold on to here so we can see something illustrated. Yeah, here's the moon. Um, So the moon in the Guardian of the Night Tarot is a coyote upending a trash can. The moon is peeking out, right? The coyote is unpredictable. The coyote is playful. The coyote has just discovered that inside of this trash can was not just uh, trash. It had water in it. It had a fish. Um, there was something you know, from the depths of what might seem worthless or useless, there was something rather wonderful, rather beautiful, right? Um, it's a very different outcome, right, or meaning than a traditional moon card. And the, um, sorry, I've written all over these. I've written the astrological associations and um, elemental, and then if you card count a la Paul Foster Case, those are on there too. Uh, because I was practicing and playing with it at one point. So, um, yeah, so we have that, we have a lot of differences here. The inclusion specifically of a coyote, you know, in my mind, changes the whole meaning of the moon, right? It changes its potential, it changes its uh, possibilities because of the inclusion of a coyote. That, to me, is not a clone, Right? I would say it's influenced, but it's not a clone. It's a different discussion altogether. Um, trying to think of other examples here. Oh, here we go. I know I had other, I knew I had some other things pulled. So something similar to this, right, which is what also how I kind of have started to try and justify to myself why I might, um, and I'm looking at another possible example right in front of myself here that I hadn't even considered until I suddenly lifted my eyes and there it was. But um, a lot of, uh, I used to kind of sit and think, why, why have so many, uh, and this is years ago, why have so many different uh, versions on your shelf, right, of Tarot de Marseille, you know, specifically reproductions. Why would anyone want to have so many different reproductions um, sitting on their shelf? Again, I'm going to say, probably for the same reason that I had so many different um, versions of Chekhov on my shelf, which is, or different translations, or even why I had different editions of Shakespeare for years. I had an incredible Shakespeare library, right? Classically trained actors and all of that, right? That's You do that. And if you're a language nerd, which I am, um, you geek out on seeing how, you know, how did each editor edit, right? And so at one point I used to have a folio, a copy of first, you know, first folio. Um, and the name of that, I cannot, it's escaping me. It's been years. Um, and I think I loaned it to someone and I didn't get it back, which is fine. I have that karma with books as, as well. Um, it was probably to a student, so more power to him. But uh, part of the joy of having that, right, having that facsimile copy of first folios was being able to look at what was originally written, 
right, in, in, in a first folio from that time, kind of like having an original TDM to hand, and then being able to compare that to whatever the editors had done in a particular version of a particular play. And if I was going to be directing something, that was critical. If I was going to be acting in something, it would influence what choices I make for a particular character. So if I'm going to play Lady Macbeth, which I did at one point, I don't want to play Lady Macbeth and not have, um, or Gertrude in Hamlet, I don't want to play that and not have uh, that copy of the first folio and various different editions, right, by different publishers to hand so that I can see how they've, you know, punctuated differently. Because the way that the language flows influences what words you emphasize, it influences where you pause, how you phrase, and therefore how you make sense of everything, right? So if you do that with language, why wouldn't you do that with image? Now, maybe some people don't need that many different versions of image to be able to understand something or they don't want it, to, you know, need it to be able to play with it. But what if you do? You know, having that, having a historical library, right, of different, and this is something that makes me really want to, but I don't have the money to invest in it, and so I don't. But I do appreciate and understand why it's not possible to just have one copy, right, of a, of, of a Tarot de Marseille. This is a 1930 Tarot de Marseille. Um, it's supposedly a facsimile, but they've taken a lot of liberty. It's not a facsimile. It's, it's a lot of liberties have been taken here, um, you know, of the, the Grimaud uh, TDM. It's not the same coloring, for example. It's actually, in my opinion, has been, you know, like, like language being edited, right? It's a, it's a better edition. Um, I actually like it better than I do some of the originals because the colors are softer. They don't feel quite so, um, harsh in the sense, you know, in, in that primary color kind of way, that in your face primary color way. So it makes it much more fun to engage with by the same token. Uh, and I don't know where it is. I don't think it's in here. If it is, I can't see it. I also have, um, I recently got a copy, and I haven't put it out yet, of the Gassman uh, Tarot, the um, 1830, 1840, um, Gassman, at Francois Gassman, and it's wonderful. Um, totally different. It's a totally different historical deck. It comes from a different part. Um, it's not French, right? Um, it's Swiss, so, you know, it is different. And I love seeing the different ways in which all of that can play out, right, in pip decks. I absolutely love it. I nerd on it. I love watching people's videos about it. I have chosen not to accumulate too many of those. I do have the Triomphe de la Luna, which pays homage to a lot of different historical decks in one deck, right? Um, I choose to go with that. I've got uh, the uh, Spanish Tarot, which is a Tarot de Marseille by Fournier. It similarly pays homage to a lot of the traditional TDM decks, but it isn't. It's it's a, a more updated, newer version. Um, you know, though those are not things that you know. That's reading tarot. It's just totally different. It's just not even the same. We're not even in the same ballpark, right? Similarly. If you look at, I've got five, five Fournier decks, Fournier, right? I have, we just saw, I have the, the Spanish tarot. Um, I have the tarot, um, tarot de Carlotide, Carlotides, Carlotides, uh, the tarot de Luz, tarot del Fuego, and el gran tarot esoterico. When you open each box, not one of these decks is alike, okay? They don't have any of the same symbolism. Their art style is completely different. Um, do some of them have a similarity to the, uh, to the RWS? Yes, absolutely. You can find some old, loose interpretations in Tarot del Fuego. Some overlaps in Tarot de Luz. 
a few more even in Terra de Carlotitis and zero, <laughs> almost none, right, in um, El Gran Terro Esoterico because it is not based, neither this one nor uh, this one is based in Rider Waite Smith. However, when you open up the guidebooks from each of these decks, you will find they are identical. So they are assigning identical meanings to each of these decks, despite them having almost no uh, overlap, right, in meaning. You almost can't place them together and say these are the same in any way, because they're just not, right? They're just not. Um, what's another good example here? There's so many, right? There's so, so many. Um, I have in front of me a Robert M. Place collection of decks, right? So why have all of Robert M. Place's decks? Because I can tell you, having um, worked with two, three, three of his decks, three, well, I mean, to some degree, I've worked with all of them, I suppose. Um, I can tell you that when you're looking at, Oops, something just crashed, and I can't see what it was because it's behind the laptop. But, oh, that's not the right one. Where am I going here? So many decks. What a mess. Um, this is a real mess. It's outrageous. Okay. In order to be able to read and understand more fully without the original guidebook, right, because when before the new version of this came out, of the Buddha Tarot, um, the only real way I could get a, a handle on it was to go back, not that that's a problem, and reread um, what everything he wrote about the alchemical tarot, right? So by understanding the alchemical tarot and rereading that, I then could understand where he was coming from. That's my broken five, that's my broken five of lotuses. Um, I could read everything in this deck, right? Um, then I thought, wait, that's so exciting. I want to know more about all of his alchemical work, right? His alchemical tarots. So then we've got the alchemical tarot of the magnum, of the tarot of the mag alchemical magnum opus, right? Which is essentially the, uh, this deck boiled down into its barest symbols. Okay. Similar kind of Similar kind of story, right? Almost exactly the same story, but told very differently. <clears throat> very differently. Then we find there is the Tarot of the Sevenfold Mystery. All right, Tarot of the Sevenfold Mystery is still going to have, it's based a slightly differently than his alchemical tarots. But when you get down to the bones, you're essentially looking at a lot of the same imagery, there's some differences included that, that make this one stand apart, but they're essentially the same. Okay, they have a lot of overlap. By the same token, by the time you get to his alchemical tarot de Marseille, you find that you're essentially looking at the pips and the way the pips are, are structured in a deck like this one, right? So you're getting the essence and the best qualities in this deck of a lot of the historical tarots, right? Like the Convert and um, the Nicholas Convert and the, the Jean Noble, right? Um, along with a bunch of the Italian decks and the Swiss decks and so on um, that are being borrowed to create this one, which is also not possible None of it would have been completely possible at all without Atea, right? Without, for, I think, for, for, uh, place. Without Atea, without, um, oh, mind, the mind is gone. Um, it'll probably come back to me and I'll, I'll kick myself. The earliest, um, esoteric, um, esotericists who had started to influence tarot heavily influence the way in which place understands tarot. So without those earlier influences, 
he wouldn't have come up and he, with or or been able to create the alchemical tarot, right? It wouldn't have been possible. But it pervades all of his work. So it's kind of like when I used to read Neil Gaiman all the time. And you can see a lot of the influences in his novels, right? The, they're, they all kind of follow a similar structure. Um, you often have a very similar main character. It's kind of like that. It's like reading the same author of a book. I think that's all of the analogies. Yeah, I guess I could even go further. We'll go one step further. I don't know that I can really, it's not going to top anything because we're already kind of there. Um, it's already over the top. Uh, one, you know, recently indulging in all of the Dame Darcy's, right? Witchy Cat, Queen Alice, and Mermaid. Um, they're all they're all going to have a very similar guidebook. The guidebook that's going to be used in each one of these decks or for each one of these decks is going to give meanings which correlate with traditional meanings in Rider Waite Smith, right? Because these are all heavily influenced by Rider Waite Smith. And yet, <laughs> okay, just doesn't, I'm going to have to pull like one or two here. I'm thinking of the chariot um, in the witchy cat, but let's see if we can find one. Yeah, okay, here we go. Here is the chariot in, in um, the mermaid tarot, okay? We can recognize that as being Rider Waite Smith conversant, okay? It's very similar. When you look at the one, the, the chariot from sorry I just had to it's it's got such a good smell from the witchy cat it is so it's from a different planet all of it is I mean a lot of these are references to things that you know are so <laughs> so specific but yet and and they correlate they correspond with the Rider Waite Smith but they are so decidedly um from a different place and time and, you know, use such different um, <clears throat> references. Here it is. This is the chariot, right, from the witchy cat. Now, how the hell am I supposed to understand this is the chariot? The sphinx is there, but the dude is on a train. The dude is a cat. He's a tiger and he's on a train. You know, and it's his, the ticket in his pocket that gives us the sense that, you know, the, the seven. It's a very different one. I've not, I've not completely felt comfortable with any interpretation of this yet. Um, I'm curious to see what she puts out about it, because when you look online, her guidebook basically directs you back to the same one that gives you the same meaning, right, as this, which is not the same right? It's just not. So, you know what I mean? They're not clones. They follow RWS in theory, but in practice, no, not at all. So, um, you know, what do, what do we learn about all of this? We learn and we learn to understand the flexibility of tarot. We learn to understand what it tells us about the tarot itself, about its history, um, about its background, um, and so forth. And within that, we're all going to find our own favorite novels. <laughs> we're going to find our own, our own favorite stories and aspects of that. But then we're going to engage with it differently, right? So each of them is going to tell each of us a different story about ourselves based on what we know about, uh, our own, about tarot, about our own experience, um, our own experience of the cards, our own experience of the way um, those cards are going to influence us and so forth. Right. So I hope that makes sense. <laughs> I really hope that makes sense. And it's not just a, um, a meaningless ramble of stuff. But yeah, it just it's something I've been thinking about for a long time. And then when I saw uh, Natalia's video earlier today, um, it really just sparked my brain. And I thought, whoa, I have a rare day off where I'm not I'm not being called to go anywhere. I don't have to do anything. Um it's not going to last for very long because 
you know, we're going to start settling estates and cleaning out residences and so forth for my godmother soon. Um, but you know, it was, it was a moment to be able to just talk about that because it's been on my mind. Right. And similarly, here's, I'm just looking, I can't stop. Now I can't stop. This is supposedly a Rider Waite Smith based deck, but it's a mushroom deck. So is it really a tarot, right? Fun things to contemplate. It definitely looks like a tarot. Um, and when you compare images to Rider Waite Smith, you can see that the way that, that the images are formed resembles Rider Waite Smith. Okay, but is it Rider Waite Smith? Is it a clone? How it can't be. It can't be. You know, it's taking something, it's taking a familiar riff. We see this in music all the time, too, where the same chords. Um, Taylor Swift is known for it, guys. She's great, right? I've got no, no problem with Taylor Swift. I absolutely adore her. Um, I struggle to listen to her music, however, because of its, its repetitive nature. Talk to somebody who really loves Taylor Swift, and they will tell you how different each song is from, from the other. Being someone who doesn't ever really listen to Taylor Swift deeply, um, at least not frequently, I can tell you I hear the same chords and the same chord progressions and the same kind of simplistic melodies um, that are in some ways predictable, written within the same vocal range, which is not particularly broad. You get the point? So it isn't that she doesn't do it extremely well. She does in the same way that Pamela Coleman Smith did, right? And because of that, um, you know, a musician, so to speak, might listen to what Taylor Swift did and say, oh, we could actually really make a better rendition of this by adding um, a few more notes to the chord that give it a slight dissonance at this point, right? by setting it in a different key or <laughs> uh, choosing to making vocal choices that jump from one octave to the next um, because the, the, the range is not so broad. Does that make sense? So we get the same thing artistically in tarot when different creators use the Rider Waite Smith chord structure <laughs> to write a new song. So yeah, it's, it's, this is, this is how we are as human beings. It's what we do. We take, we see something, we say, oh, that's really, really good. How can I, how can I take that and take my vision of it and shift it? And so when you have a, a library, right? And I think that this is something that we all could in, maybe acknowledge at some point, because I feel like this is something really critical to me. When I read read with a deck, right? Especially that's right. The, the nearest one in front of me, right? Is, uh, I'm not just reading, I'm not reading Pamela Coleman Smith here. I might, it's influenced. We're all being influenced by, by Coleman Smith's choices. Um, and Arthur Waite's interpretations of those choices, right? Um, but we're actually getting Dame Darcy's interpretation of that. So we're getting it through her filter. So we're also reading her in this. And somewhere in the midst of all of that, it blends. It comes together into something that's very new, right? We have the reader. We have what's come before. We have its roots, right? Its ancestral roots. Uh, we, have, we have its whole background. And then we've got the way that we see it, the way we feel it, the way we interpret it. And in that moment, in a particular moment, all of those come together and they create a completely new moment of reading, of insight, of interpretation, which hopefully when we reread our favorite books is going to happen again too. When I haven't read a book in 10 years and I pick it up again and decide, hey, it's been a long time since I read this. It's one of my favorite books. I think I'll pick it up and reread it. I pick up something new because I'm different because I'm not in the same place that I was the first time I read it. And I'd like to think that we do similar things when we read with a deck like this, right? Or with a historical deck or with any deck. 
something new is able to emerge. So I offer that. I hope it's of use. And um, thank you so much, Natalia, for offering such um, a juicy, um, you know, thought-provoking video. I appreciate it deeply. All right, everyone. I'll talk to you again soon. Bye.